Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. And this is Pursue 12N, which is respiratory pathology. We are live from Ames, New Delhi, via Kolkata. And the topic of the day is very interesting. Interesting cases, series, and respiratory pathology. National Perspective, Session 1. And we have two wonderful people here. Ideally, to be said, the brain and the beauty together. So first let me introduce the moderator and she's going to introduce the speaker. The moderator is Dr. Nandita Kakar. She's an MD, FICP, Professor of Histopathology and the course Director, PDCC in Pediatric Pathology at PGI Chandigarh, India. Her main interest is pediatric pathology, uropathology, bone pathology. She has done a fellowship in pediatric pathology from Children's Hospital, Los Angeles, more than 200 publications. She has guided multiple theses for MD, DM, MCH, PhD, and organized multiple conferences. She is the author of the famous book, 101 Medical Autopsy Cases, Adult and Pediatric, which the, which the foreword was given by the famous Dr. Vinay Kumar. With this, let me ask uh, Dr. Nandita Kakur, ma'am, please take over and introduce the speaker. Thank you so much, Nadeem. Thanks so much. And you're doing such a wonderful job, I must say so. And today, I, I uh, it's really my, it's a real honor and my privilege to introduce Dr. Dipali Jain, who will be presenting the special cases pertaining to the respiratory system. Dipali Jain is a star from PGI Chandigarh. She the star from there and became a superstar after joy, working in Ames and rising up to the level of an additional professor at which she is working right now. Her special interests are thoracic pathology, cytopathology, sinonasal tumors, and she has done India proud, I must say so, by being on the, and she's on the international panel of the most prestigious, uh, you know, books, the WHO fascicles. And uh, she's on the, she is the editorial board member and author for the upcoming WHO classification of lung, plura, thymus, and heart, the fifth edition. Upcoming IARC, IAC International System for Reporting Lung Cytopathology, first edition. And she's also the editor of Atlas of Thymic Pathology. Apart from so many other publications, national and international, that she's already written. So I won't take much of your time, Tipali. I can uh, go on and on uh, about you. But uh, now, so over to you now, Dipali. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. I'll just share my screen and then I'll stop talking. Just press present now and your yeah, that's it. We can see your screen. Okay. Uh, just press the right and change your point. So, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, ma'am, uh, Dr. Nandita, ma'am. It's always a pleasure to see you and listen to you. Um, thank you uh, very much for kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Nadeem, for, uh, uh, for your kind invitation. I apologize for not taking it earlier, and I've been delaying it, but I'm happy today that I'm, uh, I'm here and glad to present. Uh, so, uh, so just a brief background before uh, our cases. So, yeah. so uh, as cancer uh, in respiratory pathology or pulmonary pathology, which is a colloquial term, but actually is uh, encompassing non-small cell and small cell carcinoma. And uh, uh, it contributes uh, to the diagnosis in more than 90% of cases of pulmonary pathology. There, is, uh, there are tumors, uh, less than 10% of tumors, they are rare. But we should know and to know about uh, uh, their differentiation from the more common category of lung cancer. And each and every system on the water, there have some tumors which are more common to see day in, day out in our Practices, but then there is a lobby of rare tumors, and we should have a high tumors because we know in lung cancer, even two adenocarcinomas, uh, 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 they are not 
which I we have different predictive markers for each of them. We have different gallery of diagnostic uh, markers for them. And unless we suspect, correct diagnosis cannot be made. So uh, ultimately, it is different, and patient care is affected. So we should know uh, about these so common and uh, moreover difficulties in the pathologic diagnosis of lung tumors uh, we uh, we get routinely biopsies and cytology specimens because uh, usually lung cancers they present in advanced stage and by the time they come to the clinical uh, uh, setup they are already advanced and surgical resection is not an option so problems are that either we under diagnose them we miss the carcinoma and tell something else or something lesser than that or we misdiagnose these cancers uh, uh, as some other tumors or vice versa. And icing on the cake is that all clinical diagnoses which are written on the clinical requisition form are only carcinoma lung or tuberculosis. If you ask your clinical colleagues that what is the clinical suspicion, they will say either malignancy or tuberculosis, especially in India. Or if you are you know, lucky, then they will say, okay, sarcoidosis may also be a consideration. So, you will not get much help from the clinical most of the time, but uh, radiology is unique in some of the cases, but mostly uh, often we get this diagnosis. So, as I said, that the major diagnosis in respiratory pathology pertain to non-small cell lung cancer in the form of adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and small cell lung cancer. Uh, so, uh, in these 40-50 minutes, I'm going to talk about some cases, couple of cases which are going to revolve around this theme where uh, I'll speak on uh, these weakness switches like every glandular tumor you see is not conventional pulmonary adenocarcinoma. Every TTF1 positive tumor in lung is not primary pulmonary adenocarcinoma. Every P40 positive tumor which you see in respiratory tract pathology is not a conventional squamous cell carcinoma. And every ALK positive, because this is again an IHC, and every ALK positive tumor you see in lung is not ALK rearranged adenocarcinoma. So I'm going to talk about these cases or discuss these cases around this um, yeah, agenda. So uh, with that, uh, I'll start with my first case, who is a 50-year-old lady, non-smoker, and she has chest pain and dyspnea exertion, common lung problems. There's no past history of any tumor or malignancy. This is the contrast-enhanced CT scan of her thorax, which shows collapse of the right middle lobe. The entire lobe is collapsed because of the obstruction in the bronchus. So middle bronchus is not quite clearly visible due to obliteration by some soft tissue. So, therefore, uh, this lesion is around 2.6 cm in diameter, which is blocking right middle lobe bronchus, and therefore, there is collapse and consolidation of right middle lobe. So, uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy was performed, biopsies were obtained, and following to that, resection was done. So, this is the right bilobectomy, which is of middle and lower lobe of the right lung. And here we can see that this bronchus is kind of totally obliterated by this uh, tumor. So this is a biopsy which is fortunately very generous biopsy where we can see a tumor which is uh, uh, which is showing tubules, uh, glands, duct-like structures and some uh, papillary configuration and this is an area of necrosis. So we know that this is a glandular tumor, right? This is a glandular tumor which has uh, tubules, duct-like structures, some necrosis so it looks pretty juicy also so maybe we are dealing with a malignant glandular tumor. I'll talk about the biopsy um, uh, uh, simultaneously and this is a resection specimen for you know, gross of which I've shown you and this is showing the tumor relationship in uh, uh, within the bronchus or in the, uh, in, in the bronchial wall how this tumor is occluding this entire bronchus, bronchial human. And here also we can see that this tumor is again glandular, glandular uh, uh, and it is, it is present in the human. And these are a few shots from this tumor, which are showing again glandular differentiation, some papillary infoldings, and uh, here also these uh, little higher magnification, they show uh, these glands, they are lined by these cuboidal uh, epithelial cells. These are some mucous glands which are entrapped from the wall of the bronchus and here we can see again the tumor morphology and this is, from, uh, this is from the resected specimen. And some pictures are from the biopsy itself. So we can see the normal airway ciliated epithelium and the tumor within the wall. And this is again a glandular tumor. 
so when we zoom then uh, uh, th these glands are actually showing two kind of two cellular layers the one which is on the luminal side the other one which is on the abluminal side and they have uh, this clearing of the cytoplasm and we have seen a spot of necrosis and biopsy and these this tumor also shows mitosis so mitotic figures were there i mean they were frequently visible so uh, this is kind of certain that this is a malignant glandular tumor which is showing glands and there are two types of uh, layers in these glands and ki67 is further substantiating the fact that this is a proliferating tumor this is not a benign glandular tumor so a uh, standard approach if you see a glandular tumor in a biopsy of a lung and you would do tdf1 and napsin a which are adenocarcinoma markers both of them were negative in this case mucin was not there even morphologically and mucin stains were negative but ck7 was positive so in biopsy the two layers of this uh, these glands were oh. visible they were appreciated so p40 stain was done uh, second gamma fibro post tissue Uh, so P40 is positive. P40 is positive. Okay, so P40 is actually decorating the outer layer of the uh, these glands. So uh, the inner layer is negative, which is abluminal, and the abluminal layer is positive P for P40 immunostain. So uh, P40 is not just a squamous cell marker that we know, and uh, if this is kind of the pattern which we see in P40, we kind of know that this is a myopathical marker as well. So to uh, uh, to confirm that this is a myopathical cell, we did S100, which was also highlighting these uh, uh, abluminal uh, cells as uh, nuclear positive. And SMA is another stain which is also decorating these glands on the outer layer by positivity of uh, by SMA that is smooth muscle actin. So it is not there in the stroma; it is actually on the outer layer of these glands. So inner layer is blue, that is luminal cells which are negative, but the outer layer is positive, that is in the form of brown color. So uh, we know what is the diagnosis? It's a glandular tumor which is malignant, which is showing. Uh, uh you know two types of cells and uh, one is epithelial the other one is myoepithelial so the differential diagnosis just for theoretical purposes in endobronchial masses benign versus malignant and we know for sure that this is not a benign tumor which are very rare and uh, they they are glandular papillomas or mucus gland adenomas In malignant the most important differential diagnosis here is primary pulmonary adenocarcinoma especially the SNR and papillary pattern predominant adenocarcinomas because we have seen uh, papillary in this tumor papillary configuration of the tumor uh, of the cells as well as SNR kind of glandular configuration we have seen so this is an important diagnosis differential diagnosis which we have to take into consideration especially in biopsy specimens so uh, to differentiate these adenocarcinomas which are snr and papillary predominant uh, we know that primary pulmonary adenocarcinomas most commonly localized to lung periphery although exceptions do exist they can also arise from endobronchial uh, area but most commonly they are localized to lung periphery and approximately 75 to 80% of tumors which are showing papillary pattern or they are lapidic that means they are well differentiated they are ttf1 positive so which is not the case in this tumor and uh, well differentiated tumors are usually egfr positive uh, that's not hard and fast but egfr elk oncogenic drivers you can do to see whether this is positive these are positive uh, in these well differentiated adenocarcinomas or not so that is how you can exclude a primary pulmonary adenocarcinoma which is a more common thing uh, in pulmonary pathology and we know that this is not a pure myoepithelial carcinoma because we have not seen any ductal differentiation and uh, we will not see biphasic pattern in pure myoepithelial tumor so this is just for theory that uh, this is also a consideration if you see p40 positivity sma s100 those are myoepithelial cell markers but uh, practically speaking in this case this is not a differential diagnosis and the ewas r1 gene rearrangement is usually present in myoepithelial tumors so in current case we have a tumor which has endobronchial location which is biphasic in morphology myoepithelial cell markers are positive and this is mitotically active so and there is no history of prior primary elsewhere that i have already discussed that i have already mentioned so this is the sum up of our current case so what is the diagnosis it is obvious this is primary pulmonary epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma so uh, more details on this patient the diagnosis was offered on biopsy itself because that biphasic glandular uh, differentiation was quite evident and it was highlighted by the myoepithelial cell markers 
in this case and therefore subsequently surgery was done because this was just restricted to the endobronchial uh, area and uh, there were clear resection margins so therefore no adjuvant therapy was offered in this case and there were no driver mutations this was done for the completion uh, sake EGFR, L, cross 1 and KRAS mutations were negative in this case and at two and a half years of follow up this patient is doing well without any signs and symptoms of progression so, uh, these uh, uh, pulmonary uh, primary epithelial myoepithelial carcinomas, they uh, fall into the spectrum of salivary gland type tumors of the lung, which is a very less uh, common entity and uh, less than 1% of all lung neoplasms, they, they arise from, uh, uh, they, they are salivary gland type tumors and they originate from submucosal pseudomucinous glands which are present in the airway wall. So, this is cartilage, these are the glands which we have seen in this case. So, in WHO 2015, uh, this uh, epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma sits along with mucoap and adenoid cystic carcinomas, which are more common. Actually, mucoap and ACCs are commonest among all salivary gland type tumors, and this is a rarity. So, uh, if you have to uh, differentiate pulmonary EMAC from salivary EMAC, which is more common and more uh, known thing in salivary gland region, head neck area. So, uh, there it is more common, about uh, more than 300 cases are reported. Here, we have only less than six, uh, 50 cases so far. There is no sex predilection here in pulmonary emets, but uh, female predominance can be seen in salivary emets. So, since this is a less common entity, so uh, we don't know much about the morphologic spectrum. So, in this case, this was the papillary pattern, which has never been reported. But in salivary emets, more cases, so more spectrum. So, we have seen uh, papillary pattern, uh, people have seen papillary, tubular, ductular, sebaceous, all those patterns and differentiation because there are more cases in that area so we know about them more. So this is the tumor, uh, this particular tumor which I have just discussed has papillary configuration so that was, you know, uh, that was something unusual. But both of them are of low grade malignant nature and here what happens is that patient present early because there is an endobronchial obstruction so they have shortness of breath problem, right? So they are completely cured within a uh, time span where uh, exact, uh, you know, the complete resection is possible. But on contra in contrast, salivary emex, uh, head neck area is very complex, so complete resection is difficult. So those tumors are more prone to uh, frequent recurrences, so they tend to come back. And metastasis has also been reported in salivary emex, but in pulmonary emex, it's kind of uh, uh, complete cure is possible with surgery alone. So the take home in this case is that distinction uh, from other tumors of lung is important because it's a low grade malignant neoplasms. Even if you have to compare stage 1 tumors, stage 1 pulmonary adenocarcinoma with uh, stage 1 uh, uh, epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma, of course the prognosis is different. Progression free survival is good and these tumors, uh, they don't recur, metastasis is different and the entire uh, workup, the pathologic uh, at pathologic end as well as at the clinical end, entire workup is different for, pri for primary pulmonary adenocarcinoma. So it is a very important uh, diagnosis. I mean, it is very important. It is important to differentiate it from the primary pulmonary adenocarcinoma. So index of suspicion should be uh, should be there, and complete resection should be ensured for correct treatment. So, uh, so every glandular tumor, what you see in lung cancer uh, in lung biopsy, is not conventional adenocarcinoma. You should have uh, you know. Uh, high index of suspicion for rare tumors as well. So stay alert, don't get hurt. That holds true even in corona pandemic that we should be always, uh, you know, alert. Okay, so uh, shall I take another case, Dr. Nadeem? Let's go ahead, Dipali. Okay, okay ma'am. So, uh, uh, case 2 is a 14-year-old girl who um, uh, who underwent right lower lobectomy for a tumor which is 3.5 centimeter, very well circumscribed tumor. We can see here, this is the tumor. And on microscopy, we can see that this tumor has a lot of blood-filled spaces, right? And there is a tumor which is again showing some papillary uh, configuration and sclerotic, hyalinized dystroma some hemocytral laden macrophages and these tumor cells are very naive looking they they are cuboidal and they are lining uh, these uh, nubbins and tufts of tumor cells the tumor uh, stroma 
On higher magnification, we can see surface cells. These are the cells uh, which are present on the uh, tufts of the papillae. Okay, so these are surface cells and these are deeper cells. And uh, one can say that this is again a glandular tumor which has papillary configuration, you know, and this has a papillary as well as solid pattern. Uh, so it can be a differential diagnosis, it can be a primary pulmonary adenocarcinoma. And these are the blood fill spaces as I, as I was shown in the previous picture. So uh, again, a standard approach, TTF1, NAPS and A, if you see glands in a lung biopsy. So uh, this was this was positive for TTF1, this was resected specimen, the biopsy was also uh, present in this case similar to the first case. So TTF1 was done and it was positive in all, uh, all the cells, surface cells as well as uh, deep cells. So is it adenocarcinoma of pulmonary origin? But we have not seen much atypical tumor cells. They were quite bland looking, naive looking. There was no mitosis, no necrosis. But we have seen blood cell spaces and sclerotic stroma, right? So we can say that this is not a malignant tumor. And we know where in lung uh, we see blood cell spaces and sclerotic stroma, the tumor which is named by these two findings. And earlier it was called as a sclerosing hemangioma because this because of sclerotic stroma and hemangioma because of blood cell spaces. But later it has been realized that this is actually a tumor of pneumocytes. It derives from pneumocytes. So that is why it is named, renamed as a sclero sclerosing uh, pneumocytoma. But the caution has to be uh, uh, there in small biopsy. So in this case also a small biopsy was done. Uh, first of all, the biopsy was obtained. Or in biopsy, the, it was showing a lot of hemorrhage, sclerosis stroma and these naive looking cells. So a possibility of sclerosing pneumocytoma was offered on the biopsy and subsequently they have done resection. So sclerosing pneumocytoma is a benign diagnosis unlike the first case which was malignant. It is pneumocytic in origin. It derives from primitive respiratory epithelium and uh, 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 in, uh, in addition to the morphology, co-expression of TTF1 and napsin A in this tumor is a trap actually in differentiating it from more common primary pulmonary adenocarcinomas in small biopsy specimens. So radiology is helpful. I mean radiologists can tell at times that this is calcified, very well circumscribed mass. So they have differential diagnosis of sclerosing pneumocytoma and their differential. But if you say that okay I'm seeing these pneumocytes TTF positive, I cannot differentiate it from adenocarcinoma, then they will also be like you know I don't know you have to tell the answer. So uh, caution has to be there and this, uh, this has to be differentiated correctly and uh, so TTF1 and napsin A uh, the difference is that TTF1 is present in uh, surface as well as round cells which are present in the stroma unlike napsin A which is only present on the surface so the deeper cells are negative in napsin A and similarly keratin is only present on the surface so because it is a primitive respiratory uh, epithelial tumor uh, it is proposed that it is derived from there. That is why TTF1 is positive in both the components and uh, napsin A which is a mature uh, surfactant, you know, protein uh, as parties. So that is why it only is present on the surface. So that, that holds true for keratin also. So this is how uh, IHC of sclerosing pneumocytoma look like. And uh, so this is a benign tumor and uh, it has to be differentiated from malignant uh, adenocarcinoma. So every TTF1 positive tumor, if you see in a lung biopsy, is not uh, adenocarcinoma. So always be uh, careful. All right. Coming to the next case, uh, who is a 36-year-old man who is non-smoker and uh, uh, presented with a mediastinal mass, which is almost blowing up on this back scan. Ebus FNA has been done on this case and it shows a tumor. Uh, this is not normal lymphoid tissue. This is a tumor which is showing these uh, round uh, basophilic, I mean, uh, hyperchromatic cells, and they are primitive appearing because there is no differentiation. Very prominent nucleolus. Dirty necrosis in the background, and uh, we can see one mature looking squamous cell. Further zoom in to show these primitive cells, which are like this. They are quite fragile. I think they have. They are. They are looking like naked nuclei, and uh, there are some neutrophils within uh, accompanying these tumor cells. These are few more areas on the FNA smear where we can see that these cells. Uh, these are more differentiated cells. They are polygonal. They have a lot of cytoplasm. 
right? And here they are kind of showing the tadpole type of shape and some keratin or angiophilia in the cytoplasm. So we can see that this there is definitely a squamous differentiation going on in this tumor along with these primitive appearing cells which we have already seen. The cell block of this case shows uh, both areas as we have seen on smears. These are the uh, uh, mature squamous cells and these are basaloid cells which have undergone crushing artifact and they are primitive appearing cells which we have just recapitulating the same thing which we have seen on smears. So P40 was done because we have seen squamous differentiation and it was diffusely positive not only just in uh, mature squamous areas but also in basaloid cells. So is it a squamous cell carcinoma? This is a question but we have know the clinical of this case who is a young chap non-smoker. So by and large squamous cell carcinomas are a problem of smokers right and in elderly patients we, uh, we, we see squamous cell carcinoma. So before putting it uh, on the uh, in black and white as a squamous cell carcinoma, we should see, uh, uh, we should you know think about it, rethink about it. So this is endobronchial biopsy. It was not just mediastinal mass; it was also eroding the end, uh, bronchial uh, mucosa. And this is the endobronchial biopsy from there. It shows surface dysplasia of squamous cells, and down there we see these blue cells, which are again showing crushing artifact. Uh, so uh, we have both components here in this biopsy. And on zoom in, we can see neutrophils. Uh, these are the tumor cells, which are the same cells which we have seen on FNSMIA. So NUT. Uh, NUT IHC was positive in this case. Uh, this patient was young and non-smoker, as we have uh, discussed. And this is a clone of NUT IHC. For saying something NUT positive, we should have 50% or more than 50% tumor cells should show positivity, which is in the form of speckled pattern. So this was positive not only in mature squamous cells, but also in basal white cells. So P40 is positive and NUT is positive. So be wary of the fact that P40 is not always positive in NUT carcinomas and uh, people have found out that the isoform matters in NUT carcinoma, right? And if you do just P40, P40 comes negative, do not uh, stop it there. And uh, if you are suspecting NUT carcinoma, you do NUT IHC. In fact, they say that P63 is a better isoform than P40. So this, uh, this is another case, which is a mediastinal nut carcinoma, where even CK was negative. So they sometimes uh, fool you, nut carcinomas. You uh, don't see abrupt squamous differentiation in all the cases. Only 30% of cases you see abrupt squamous differentiation. So we should have a high index of suspicion for nut carcinomas. And they may be CK negative, they may be P40 negative. And if you have a suspicion, please do nut IHC. And this case was positive for P63 negative for P40, but NUT was full house. So NUT carcinoma, practically speaking, it's a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma only, but it is differentiated from squamous cell carcinoma by its aggressive behavior, by its pathogenesis. It has uh, it is, uh, it has uh, NUT M1 gene rearrangement, right? And so it is different from squamous cell carcinoma. These are primitive tumor cells with very conspicuous nuclei. So if you minus the squamous cells from the FNA smear, it would lead on to a differential of small cell carcinoma because they were, you know, crushed artifact, hyperchromatic tumor cells but they were showing prominent nucleus so that's a very helpful clue uh, to diagnose nut carcinoma they have a very conspicuous nucleus and extremely aggressive tumors median survival is less than six months thoracic nut uh, carcinomas if you compare with other extra thoracic uh, nut carcinomas they have a very poor very poor survival very poor prognosis and less than six months uh, survival and we have bromodomain inhibitors they are being uh, tried in these patients uh, in clinical trials, so uh, patients may get benefited if, uh, if they are registered in these clinical trials. So that is the importance of diagnosing nut carcinoma uh, correctly. So with this team, uh, I'll discuss this case, a case four, who is a 44-year-old male who is non-smoker and has history of cough and dyspnea, same clin uh, lung problem, and he has a contact history of pulmonary tuberculosis. So here uh, we can see that this is a tumor again present in the bronchus. So this is a left main bronchus and it is occluding. This mass-like lesion is occluding and resulting into collapse of the tumor. And this patient also has enlarged hilar lymph nodes. So anything clinicians see with the lumen of the bronchus, the clinical differential, clinical and radiologic differential is carcinoid. So therefore this is there in this case as well. 
so because this was a bronchus problem bronchoscopy was done and they have seen growth within the left lower lobe bronchus the bronchus biopsy was done and it was reported as carcinoma from outside ebus tdna has been done from enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes so it was a diagnosis uh, of carcinoma from outside and ebus tdna was uh, i mean mediastinal lymph nodes were enlarged so the clinical diagnosis was primary lung carcinoma with query lymph node metastasis so this is ebus tdna aspirate which was showing just acute necro inflammatory exudate but there was no tumor so the tumor was only in the bronchus and this is a biopsy which was reviewed in aims and it shows this tumor which is present again in bits and fragments some hemorrhage which looks procedural and the stroma is a uh, little bit fibrous and uh, highly raised and this case was positive for p40 and i'll discuss the diagnosis uh, in a while and ttf1 was negative and uh, since the carcinoid was a, a differential diagnosis you were looking markers were done they were negative so this was only positive for p40 however there was no keratinization or any keratin pulse so uh, following to the biopsy report left lower lobectomy was done with mediastinal lymph node dissection and it was a 3.5 cm tumor which was occluding the lumen of the bronchus and adjoining lung parenchyma you see that pus filled fossae and it was actually oozing out from the lung parenchyma when it was pressed and we can see that cage is in necrosis within the uh, within these uh, enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes along with fossae in the lung parenchyma so this is the picture uh, uh, of the tumor which was occluding the uh, bronchial lumen and this is the relationship with the bronchial wall some mucus glands here cartilage this is the mucosa and this is a tumor right there in the wall of the bronchus this is a high magnification to show that these tumor cells they have no glandular differentiation no keratinization nothing but they show some eosinophilic some eosinophilic and some clearing of the cytoplasm and this is this is where the tumor cells are present in nests trabeculae small groups and uh, and and in cords and the stroma is very very highlinized and fibrous it's ossicellular stroma so that's a characteristic thing and entrapped mucus glands are because of obstruction they are dilated and filled up with mucus so these are uh, uh, emit these tumor cells so on higher magnification here it is visible uh, very clearly that these tumor cells are polygonal they have a lot of clear cytoplasm and at some places they have shown these uh, this eosinophilic cytoplasm and the ebus uh, uh, the adjoining lung parenchyma as well as lymph nodes from the media stanum they show uh, similar to the ebus what we have seen necrotizing granulomas Uh, here granulomas are also seen along with necrosis langhans type of giant cells although the afb stain was negative but this patient with a contact history of tuberculosis and that kind of cross uh, we can say that this is tuberculosis nothing else so to sum up the case this is a submucosal tumor in a large airway without any dysplasia and remnant overlying mucosa and it's a clear and eosinophilic tumor there is no differentiation uh, in the form of keratinization or keratin pearl but there is a, a phenotype Uh, of its famous differentiation because there was p40 positivity as uh, can be seen here so this is diffusely positive for p40 although the differential could be here that agnos minus carcinoma so ttf1 and napsin uh, were done to rule out the adeno component although we have not seen glandular differentiation so this was ttf1 napsin negative myopathical markers because we just discussed the uh, emac where uh, you know myopathical p40 can be uh, an indicator of myopathical uh, origin so other myopathical markers were negative in this case and this is the diagnostic uh, uh, diagnostic thing of this tumor which shows ews r1 break apart rearrangement on fish so the diagnosis is now known that's primary hyaluronizing clear cell carcinoma of lung uh, which was offered uh, on biopsy and subsequent to that resection was done so this word hyaluronizing has been actually uh, uh, omitted in previous who classifications uh, in lung cancer in uh, who lung 2015 it was removed and it was only clear cell carcinoma similarly in head neck who 2017 they have just kept this clear cell carcinoma term because they thought that hyaluronization may not be there in these tumors but now it has been realized that this is a very characteristic and helpful morphologic feature of this case or this diagnosis so they are bringing it back uh, in who lung as well as who head neck they are keeping this term again and they uh, we will again call them as hyaluronizing clear cell carcinoma 
and uh, uh, they are low grade malignant epithelial tumors they are endobronchial and primary uh, uh, highlights in clear cell carcinoma is only 11 reported cases so far in literature and this is important to differentiate uh, from squamous cell carcinomas because they are kind of low grade malignant tumors no recurrences no metastases exceptions are everywhere but by and large they don't metastasize they don't recur if you completely resect them out and on biopsies it, it poses uh, problems with the squamous cell carcinoma but if you have ews r1 atf1 fusion in the form of break apart that's that's seen in almost all reported cases in uh, highlights in clear cell carcinoma so it's actually origin is not known it's still disputed but they are still keeping it along with salivary gland tumors um, in lung as well as in head neck so it it, it is uh, sitting uh, in current who along with mucoap adenoid cystic pleomorphic adenoma and myoepithelial carcinomas so uh, the uh, the uh, take home here is that every p40 positive tumor you see in lung biopsy is not conventional squamous cell carcinoma it can be a uh, myoepithelial tumor emac it can be nut carcinoma it can be hyaluronic and clear cell carcinoma so be wary of this fact um, uh, about this positivity Coming to case five, uh, coming to case five, who is a 60-year-old man uh, with right lower lobe lung mass, and this is the mass which is seen here in the lung parenchyma. On uh, microscopy, it shows a tumor with glandular differentiation. We can see glandular differentiation, and there are a lot of signet ring cells that we can identify from the low power. These are the tumor cells which show a lot of cytoplasm, which is mucin, mucin, and eccentrically placed tumor nuclei right some solid areas some glands so this is a tumor which is solid predominant which was uh, some snr differentiation was there but lot of signet ring cells so dtf1 was positive in this case um, and uh, and we know that alk rearranged tumors they usually show solid mucinous cribriform and signet ring cytology so this case similarly was positive for alk t5 f3 which is a clone which we use um, for alk rearrangement and primary lung adenocarcinoma so this was used in this case and it was positive uh, diffusely and strongly and similarly on fish uh, uh, this shows positivity in the form of uh, 3 dash uh, split pattern so this case was positive for uh, alk rearrangement so this is an easy one primary pulmonary adenocarcinoma which is solid and snr predominant pattern uh, with signet ring cells and it was alk rearranged and we know that alk rearranged tumors kind of show this kind of morphology now we go on to uh, another case who is a 12 year old boy who has an endobronchial mass which can be seen here on bronchoscopy so again as i said that whenever they see endobronchial mass the clinical differential diagnosis is carcinoid tumor um uh, is carcinoid tumor and uh, uh, since this was a uh, you know, very young boy uh, they also kept a differential of imt because this tumor not only has endobronchial component but also has significant parenchymal component as we can see on ct scan right so imt was another differential uh, in this case so this is an endobronchial cryobiopsy where we got generous pieces of uh, bronchial mucosa which are lined by respiratory epithelium and on deeper section actually one of the bigger chunks show some cells otherwise it was all infarcted biopsy respiratory lined mucosa but nothing was there but on deeper section some cells emerged and showed up nature of which is unknown entirely we don't know what these cells are they are just dispersely lying you know creeping within the stroma like this and uh, since the differential diagnosis was carcinoid and imt we did ck ck was negative ttf1 was negative synaptophysin was also done and they were negative so the diagnosis was also uh, in consideration uh, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor we did alk as well so this is alk1 uh, which is a different clone of antibody which uh, we use for imts which we use for lymphoma detection this is not a high affinity or uh, high sensitivity clone such as d5f3 which we use for uh, um, lung adenocarcinomas for detecting alk rearrangement so since this was imt we did alk1 and it was showing positivity in those cells which were quite uh, you know uncharacteristic of anything so they were like this so uh, since we did not see any plasma cells you know uh, for saying this is imt and there were very less tumor cells they were not uh, representing the entire tumor so we wanted to do something else 
There may be ganglion like cells which we see in IMT or inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, but we were hesitant and we wanted to do further panel of IHC, but by that time tissue was exhausted. And since the clinicians have seen a significant parenchymal component of this tumor, they went ahead and they did CT guided lung biopsy. And this was quite representative of the tumor. So this is a tumor which is, there's no native or normal tissue, this is entirely tumor, which is showing a lot of tumor cells with the round nucleus clearing of the cytoplasm and they have prominent nucleoli and they have no pattern, there is no arrangement, no glandular differentiation, nothing. And this is a very young uh, child, 12 year old child and this is a sprinkling of lymphocytes. So since we have seen ALK positivity in uh, cryobiopsy, we, uh, we did uh, EMA. So CK was negative, CK was negative in the biopsy as well, but EMA was a strongly and diffusely positive. And we did CD30, CD30 was diffuse and strong positive, LCA was positive, whereas CD3 and CD20 stains were negative. So we know the diagnosis now. This is ELK1, which is again not ELK T5F3, and it shows nuclear and cytoplasmic positivity, which is kind of an indication that this patient has ELK and BM1 rearrangement. And uh, so the diagnosis uh, in this case is anaplastic large cell lymphoma of lung. So it's again a very rare entity, even WHO, uh, even the upcoming WHO doesn't talk about this entity because only 10 reports uh, in literature uh, just 3-4 years ago. And to say whether this is primary uh, pulmonary anaplastic large cell lymphoma, uh, criteria are laid down um, and they, uh, they include that we should have a definite histopath diagnosis of lymphoma, which is there in this case. Disease should be limited to the lung with or without mediastinal and hilar lymphadenopathy, which is not there in this case. Uh, mediastinal lymph nodes were not enlarged, and this patient also uh, did not have any peripheral lymph nodes. And there should not be any occurrence of lymphoma within tissues or organs other than the bronchus. So by uh, keeping these criteria in mind and by doing by going uh, going by the clinical and radiological uh, analysis this patient is a case of anaplastic large cell lymphoma of lung and uh, this is a recently diagnosed case so they will treat and then we'll get to know the follow up of this patient so uh, so uh, why i'm showing this case uh, because uh, so elk rearranged pulmonary adenocarcinomas then we have seen alcl or anaplastic large cell lymphoma uh, so these are alcomas they these are the tumors uh, which uh, uh, which share a target of elk gene this is anaplastic lymphoma kinase gene and where it fuses with different partners for example eml4 most frequently in NSCLC, uh, NPM1 in anaplastic large cell lymphoma, TPM3 in inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, and VCL in renal medullary carcinoma. So these are uh, the tumors which show ALK positivity, but they are of different phenotypes because of different fusion partners they, uh, they carry along. So this is a journey of ALK uh, discovery in oncology. It started from ALCL, that is anaplastic large cell lymphoma, went on to IMT, then NSCLC. It, uh, this is a major discovery in field of lung cancer. We have, they have found out uh, the predictive uh, drug predictive, as a predictive biomarker and now we have targeted drugs available for these patients and they do wonder. So uh, uh, along with uh, this rearrangement, uh, people have seen ALK mutations and amplifications in neuroblastomas, in rhabdomyosarcomas, and in anaplastic thyroid carcinomas. So uh, they also have got approval of ALK inhibitors in these, these tumors where the mutations in ALK gene have been discovered. So these are two types of uh, tumors which I've just shown. And this is case uh, seven, which is a short case. This is again a 14 year old boy who has a tumor which is entirely involving the lung, low, one of the low. And this was, this is kind of variegated tumor, very, uh, some places it is tan, some places it is solid and gray white. And it shows a very familiar look. We know what this is. This is a respiratory lining epithelium with cilia on it. And this is a tumor which is showing a lot of cells, but we are familiar with these cells, which are our, which are plasma cells, right? So plasma cells, some ganglion-like cells, and some spindly cells, which are better seen in this picture. Some spindle cells with indistinct borders, a lot of eosmoflex cytoplasm. And these are the plasma cells. And we know these are inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors and lung is a very favorite site uh, for these tumors and usually happen in um, uh, pediatric age group 
and uh, in pediatric and young adults, 50% of tumors show uh, health positivity. And that denotes that there is an ALK rearrangement and uh, uh, because of which crizotinib has been tried in these patients and they sometimes re reduce the size of the tumor uh, <coughs> as a new adjuvant therapy pre-surgery. So crizotinib can be given to these patients to reduce the size as a new adjuvant and this is this is just a garden variety of inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor wanted to complete this spectrum of alcomas in, uh, in respiratory tract. So I have some time, yeah, so <clears throat> just five minutes. So this is a case, uh, last case, case eight, who is a 25 year old man and he has a big mass over seven centimeter uh, right lower lobe mass, which is, which is involving the entire lobe of the lung. So these are further cuts on the CT scan and it, this tumor is <clears throat> everywhere. So this is involving the entire uh, lower lobe of the right lung. People have seen, uh, 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 bone scan, on bone scan, uh, clinicians have seen that lytic lesions are there in right humerus, left femur, left dent rib. So lytic lesions were there. They were not sure whether this is metastasis or, <clears throat> or something else, but uh, they were showing some avidity. So uh, lytic lesions are there. Biopsy has been done in this case as well and followed by dissection. So this is a biopsy of this patient. And we can see that these tumor cells, they are very angry looking tumor cells. They have a lot of cytoplasm, we can see here. They're kind of rhabdoid looking, eccentric to centrally placed nucleus and uh, some sprinkling of inflammatory cells in between. But there is no differentiation in the form of glands, in the form of, you know, uh, uh, no squamous differentiation, no clearing, but these are rhabdoid or plasma cytoid type of cells. And very uh, angry looking cells, very dangerous looking cells, very prominent multiple nucleoli and uh, bizarre nucleoli, mitotic figures. This is just one of them, but there were plenty of them, mitotic figures and plasma cells. We can see plasma cells here, right? These are endothelial cells. And this is an IHC, which, uh, which is lighting up this whole tumor. So there was not, uh, all the IHCs were negative, panel of IHC is negative, only one IHC lighted up this tumor. I'm not going to disclose this IHC today and uh, I will um, I'll take you to the case in next talk, this case. And uh, I'll tell you that following the biopsy report, they have done <coughs> right lower lobectomy of this patient. Entire, as I said, entire lobe was involved. So this is a tumor and they have done mediastinal lymph node dissection because lymph nodes were also enlarged. And this is a tumor which is quite vascular looking, almost uh, bulging out, you know, from the uh, lobe itself. And this is the micros, uh, this is the gross uh, uh, photograph, uh, which is after fixation, it looks like this variegated tumor. Again, gray white areas, some necrosis maybe uh, here. And, uh, and this is a gross look of this tumor. And this is again a fish which is related to this case, which I'm not going to tell today. Keep thinking about this case and stay tuned for the answer. I'll have a next talk, uh, maybe I think after two weeks or so, then I'll discuss this case. So thank you very much. I think I have not exceeded my time. And for thymic problems, please refer to my book, which is full of illustrations, at Plus of Thymic Pathology. With that, I, I close this session. Thank you. Uh, you you are uh, you are muted. Please unmute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Dipali. Such wonderful cases, and uh, honestly, we've learned so much today. Thanks so much. And uh, any questions from anyone? Anybody wants to ask anything? I think most of the cases are pediatric, actually, ma'am. I think they are falling exactly into your domain. <laughs> yeah, they are my domain. Most of the cases are pediatric, child. <laughs> Lovely cases, really. So every P40 is not a scramble cell and every, you know, TDF1 is not an adenosine. <laughs> just remember all these details. Stop, just stop presenting Dr. Dipali so that we can... Oh, talk. okay. Okay, okay. Uh, there are a lot of questions and comments on the chat box. I think we can you can read them or Dr. Nandita can read it to you. That's the way. Okay, you my YouTube can is you not on. Uh, can you read them, uh, Nadeem? Okay. It's on the chat box on and on your screen only. Dr. Dipali can see it on the chat box on the on the right corner. 
Mm. You have a chat box. If we just press the chat. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you can go over and you can see the people even diagnosing cases as you were presenting. Okay, so Bala, yeah, my favorite uh, uh, resident, Bala, has diagnosed sclerosing pulmonary hematoma, yeah. So it is now known as a sclerosing pneumocytoma, Bala, as you know that people have heard that this is actually a pneumocytic tumor. Then, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Pranav Bhattacharya, primary myopithelial carcinoma of the lung is a very rare tumor. Indeed, it is very rare, arising from the salivary gland of the respiratory epithelium. Yeah. So, in uh, upcoming WHO, they are keeping myopithelial carcinoma and myopithelial tumors in the salivary gland classification. In, in 2015 classification, it was not there. It was separate. And then he said the tumor may the spindle and clear cell very correctly said the spindle cells are in fascicles, resulting in spindle sarcoma. The clear cells had global nuclei with mild or moderate ATPR, forming solid or lamellar, or were divided into. I think he's uh, just writing it. There's no question. Yeah, Bala again, uh, like the diagnosis, but thank you, Bala. Primary pulmonary myopithelial adenocarcinoma, Japanese men in adults. Does it also children? What are the incidence? So uh, they say that myopithelial tumors uh, mostly occur in Asians uh, than uh, Caucasians. Uh, children, I don't know. They are they are tumors of adults. Maybe some cases have been reported in children. I don't know the exact incidence. I don't know the exact incidence. Okay. This is sclerosing mucoab. Okay, so for that hyalinizing clear cell carcinoma, I think uh, Bala is guessing sclerosing mucoab. Uh, very correct. Actually, mucoab is a differential diagnosis for um, uh, hyalinizing clear cell carcinoma. But uh, 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 first of all, the P40. P40 will not be diffused in mucoabs and uh, So we have seen mucus filled cyst in this case because of blockage of the bronchus. We have not seen glandular differentiation, but there are cases where glandular differentiation and mucin has been allowed in highlighting clear cell carcinomas. So, therefore, this is an important differential diagnosis. So say that you do mammal uh, rearrangement for mucolab, and if you get EWSR, that is diagnostic of highlighting clear cell uh, carcinoma. Um, this is correct. Uh, pulmonary sclerosing pneumocytoma is shown to be primitive, very right, most likely from uh, type 2 alveolar pneumocytes. This is benign tumor. Yeah, benign tumor, but it can metastasize. So, as I said, the exceptions are every uh, even benign tumors can metastasize and they can recur. Yeah, I have seen those reports. I think these are the comments. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Bala is there if he wants to make a comment. I mean. Hi, Bala. Hi, ma'am. Hi, ma'am. Both, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Uh, excellent session, ma'am. Thank nice you, Bala. You, <laughs> Same here. <laughs> Bala is your favorite resident, so he's, he's mine too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Definitely. <laughs> Well, then, uh, if no questions are there, then we can uh, finish the session today. Thank you so much, Dipali, and thank you, Nadeem. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks so much. Thank, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Dr. Dipali, for taking out time, and Dr. Nandita for consenting to moderate. Finally, we have you here, and uh, we would like to have you as a full session. Of course. Definitely. Yeah, don't worry. We are, we are coming up with an invitation. <laughs> I'll definitely well. come. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I like that that enthusiasm and that, you know, told everything very nice. Thank you, Dr. Zipali. See you soon. See you, soon. God bless you. God bless you, Dr. Nandita. Take care, everybody. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Good night. Take care. Bye. Good night. Bye.